can only imagine. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside on the back, sealed up with the seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to be able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you, to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands <clears throat> saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power wealth wisdom might honor glory and blessing and I heard every created thing which is in heaven or on earth or under the earth or on the sea and all things in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be the blessing the honor the glory and the dominion forever and ever and the four living creatures were saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Amen? Amen? We all know who that's about, right? Amen. So. But, but I have stood when the one who himself is other and different touches that which is ordinary, it becomes extraordinary. So in case you don't know who that is, that's R.C. Sproul, real young. And that's a guy that I like to listen to. He's, he's a Calvinist, so whatever that means to you, it means. But he's, he's a guy that I like to listen to his teaching. But here's what he just said. What makes something holy is the touch of God upon it. When the one, who we know who that is, right? When the one who himself is other and different, so we know who he's talking about, touches what is ordinary, whenever that happens, it becomes extraordinary. R.C. Sproul is absolutely correct. The Lord's Supper is extraordinary because Jesus touched it and made it holy. Ordinary bread and ordinary wine touched by Jesus Christ and then 2,000 years later we celebrate this extraordinary God-man with reverence and honor because He touched it. He made it holy. Will you join me? Please stand, everyone, as we kick off a call to worship as a call to the Lord's Supper by reading the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing if you can. Lynn, can I get your help? Miss Tammy, could you please pass out the sacraments to our congregation? This is a call to participate in the Lord's Supper. And if obviously we open this call with the Lord's Prayer. 
if you wish, please continue standing, but if you can't, feel free to sit down. So Jesus told us the following words in John chapter 6, when we read in verses 47 through 51 this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which come down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give, that I shall give, is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. We remember this morning our Savior Jesus Christ, the Christ who is the bread of life. We remember exactly what He did for us by taking the punishment, right? By taking the punishment and the wrath of God for our our disobedience. We also remember that He rose on the third day to find death so that we all may live forever with Him. I invite all of you who belong to Jesus Christ, those of you who belong, to remember Him by partaking in the Lord's Supper. If you truly believe Jesus Christ is the Lord and He is Lord of your life, take joy in what is about to happen. Take joy in remembering who He is what He did for you, and the wedding feast that we so often talk about that we're going to attend someday. Please join me. Please join me in partaking if you want. And He took the bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Holy Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer that cup of wrath for us. Please partake. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. This is the new covenant of my blood. Please partake. Praise be to God for His gift to us, the Christ Jesus of Nazareth. Please bow your head for prayer. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Son, who is the true bread of life sent from heaven above for our salvation. We praise you, Father God, and you, Jesus Christ, for the love and the mercy that you continually pour out on us. Please help us remember every day, Father, every day exactly what our Savior Jesus Christ did for us when he took that sin and he cleansed us as white as snow, Father. It's hard to believe, but white as snow, friends. Father, I ask for your strength in displaying your love as we go out in the world today and every day as we exit these doors. Praise be to your holy, holy, holy name, Father God. Amen. Amen. All right, be seated, please. Welcome, everybody. Different way to open it up, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Well, let me uh, invite the Lord in, into our worship today. Heavenly Father, praise be to your holy, 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 holy name today, Father. We gather here today to worship you, to praise you, to celebrate you, to study your word, to learn what you have for us today. Father, I just ask for your guidance, and I ask for your blessing on this worship service today. I ask that uh, the words that are spoken are the words that you want to be said. I ask for me personally, Father, that I step out of the way and just let it flow so they can, we all can hear what you want us to hear. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this group of people in this room, as well as this neighborhood here, of those who love you. Father, please help us to continue every day to study your word diligently and to just draw closer to you through your word. Because, Father, it's the word that's going to change things around here. It's your word that builds character, and we just need it. We just need you in a mighty way, Father, because this nation, this nation is far from you. Very far from you, Father, and I just pray. Please don't abandon us. Please hang in there with us and just continue to send the Holy Spirit here. Heavenly Father, I also want to pray for you this time who goes into surgery this week. Uh, she's, uh, she's comfortable with what's going on, Father, but I just know that your peace and your strength and your comfort fixes everything. So, Father, I just ask on that day that she feels your presence in a very real way. And finally, Father, we read about it earlier, the Lamb of God, your Son, how He has the authority for everything, Father. I come to you and we come to you with a gratitude and a thankfulness for what you have done for us, Father, because it's just... Hard, it's just hard to come up with the words for the thankfulness that I have for choosing me to be a part of your flock, 
in choosing this congregation to be a part of your flock. I am forever grateful, Father, and please, please help me, Father, never, ever forget exactly what you did for us. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's meet and greet, and then we're going to sing. because the list she gave me is at my house so I'm trying to wing it. Oh, I'm sorry. I am so sorry, guys. But we were singing and praising, right? Yes, we are. Alright, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully I can pull it through with this sermon here today. And uh, and you folks from out of town, <laughs> come back, alright? <laughs> so, let me just pray real quickly and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this beautiful day that you've given us to get together and discuss your business. Again, Father, I ask for your help. I ask for your help with the words and the actions that's going to be said here today. Please, Father, please just kick me out of the way and let this all flow about what you want it to flow about, Father. I need your help in a mighty, mighty way. In your son's precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. The word doubt. Now I got a question. You know me questions, right? Here's my question. I think the first one of the day. There is no doubt that life is full of doubt. Would you agree? Yes. That's weird to say, but you would agree, right? There is no doubt that life is full of doubt. Now, I want you to think about how many times a day you doubt something. And be honest with yourself. How many times a day do you doubt something? If you could read my thoughts, here are some things you might see Brian thinking. The first one is this. I doubt the Chiefs will win the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> All right? <laughs> That's one of the things you'll see. Now here's another one. In the spirit of truthfulness, and I am embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to say it. Sometimes I doubt that most of the people taking the food from the blessing box are really in need. It's a true statement right there, but it's doubt that I have. I, here's my final one. I doubt the current political situation is going to get any better. That's just Brian talking, all right? So, does any of those ring true for you guys? Any of them? Hopefully not the second one, right? So, maybe not. But I do know this. I know that all of us doubt things all the time. Every day, we're all full of doubt. So, what is the definition of doubt? Here's what dictionary.com says. It states that doubt is to be uncertain about, consider questionable or unlikely, hesitate to believe. That makes sense on what doubt is, right? Now today we're going to talk about how a particular instance of doubt played a very significant role in defining the initial stages of spreading the gospel. Now last week we learned that immediately after Jesus resurrected, He did not ascend into heaven, right? But rather He somehow stayed in the area. I don't know, it's hard to explain, but He wasn't in heaven. He definitely wasn't in heaven because he hadn't ascended yet. Where he was, it's, we are not told biblically, but it sure is fun for me to think about anyway. But after witnessing the devastating event of Jesus being crucified, those disciples were in disarray. Jesus knew, because of this disarray, that he had to lay the groundwork for those disciples for what was to come next in history. He needed to equip those guys. He needed to give clarity and he needed to give instruction to those chosen disciples. He also needed to do it for the world. And why did he need to do this? Because he needed to prepare for his return. That's what's going on here. Now after miraculously appearing in a locked room, Jesus set about showing the disciples that he was indeed alive. During this encounter, he breathed, right? Remember how we read about that? He breathed the Holy Spirit into their souls. And then he gave them instruction on preparing the world for his return. It was specific instructions. Do you guys remember what it was? And that is to do what? To deliver a message. And what was that message? The forgiveness of sins. The gospel, right? We're talking about the gospel. 
Now, right after this event, we see a phenomenon occur that still plagues humanity to today. It has not run away. And that is doubting. Or not believing truth about Jesus Christ. Do you remember what Matthew said at the end of his gospel? Do you remember when we studied that right after Easter? And it was about doubt? Let me refresh your memory real quick. After Jesus resurrected and he met the disciples on the mountain in Galilee, we read this in Matthew 28, 17. And when they saw him, those disciples, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Now how can this be, friends? How can this possibly be true? How can there be any possibility of seeing with your own eyes and hearing about a man experience the brutality of crucifixion? Then you see that he is dead. Dead, dead, dead. Then you witness that he is missing from the burial tomb that he was placed in after he died. After he was killed. And then you witness this man alive standing in front of you on a mountain. Can you have a doubt of who he is? How is that possible, friends? How is that possible? But yet, after Jesus appeared for the first time to some of those disciples in a room in Jerusalem that we talked about, we see doubt rear its ugly head again. Now let's continue on with our series on the next 50 by reading John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them this time. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in his presence of his disciples, which are not written of in the book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We have no idea why Thomas was not in the room that first time Jesus appeared. But it is reasonable to conclude that Thomas was going through some personal turmoil. He must have been wrestling with his feelings and his emotions, right? He, along with the other disciples, had abandoned Jesus before the crucifixion. And Thomas no doubt knew about the killing of his master. Surely, he and all the disciples were struggling with what was going on in these last three days, three days plus a week. It could not have been an easy time in their life. Something was going on with Thomas. That's why he wasn't in that group the first Sunday night after Jesus arose. Now Jesus appeared to that first group, and very quickly after this first encounter with that risen Savior, those disciples were so excited that they needed to get a hold of Thomas to tell him what happened. Can you get that picture here? They're so excited, maybe perplexed. Who knows what the words are that they are? But whatever it is they are, they needed to get a hold of Thomas and tell him what happened. Can you imagine their excitement? Would it be fair to say that they were probably in shock as well at what they had just experienced? That's reasonable. They found Thomas very quickly after seeking him out. And they told Thomas what had just happened. Now I can imagine those guys just standing in a group in front of Thomas just rambling and telling him about exactly what was going on. It reminds me of my grandchild Charlie. That girl, when she tells a story, she's got some gusto. She's got spunk. She's boom, boom, all over the place. That's what I'm reminded of if this group is telling Thomas about what's going on. But Thomas's response after hearing this was cold-hearted, cold-hearted disbelief. Thomas makes this incredible statement after hearing this story. When we read in verse 25 this, 
The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord, Thomas. We have just seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see the hands, see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand in his side, Thomas says, point blank, I will not believe. Thomas is extremely defiant here, isn't he? He's cold-hearted. He's hard-headed. It kind of makes me think he may have had a hardened heart. I don't know. But he's saying, point blank, I am not going to believe it unless I see it. He is not buying for sure what his friends are selling, right? I can just see this whole group going through that thing right there. And to me, it's incredible. It is absolutely incredible that an original follower of Jesus, a person that Jesus himself handpicked, handpicked to be a disciple, refusing to believe other handpicked disciples, a factual story about his master. To me, that is incredible. The doubting of Thomas is a much deeper issue than it appears on the surface, friends. Here is what is really going on with doubting Thomas. Thomas is refusing to receive, to receive the message. He is not willing to receive the gospel through hearing about it. And that's a huge problem, friends. That is a really big problem for the world. Why? Because the gospel going forward, is going to be shared by words, not by seeing. Not by seeing His risen Savior, not by seeing Jesus Christ. It will be done by speaking and hearing, not by Jesus standing in front of you. So Jesus decides to do something about this issue with Thomas. He doesn't take it lying down. He's going to do something about it. He is going to teach a better way to receive the message. A better way than the way Thomas received it. That better way to receive the gospel is not to come to faith by seeing, but by hearing. Now, a small detour is needed here, friends, because it's important. This exact issue, seeing and hearing, this exact issue plagues the children of Israel today. Most of the children of Israel, God's chosen people, the ones He picked to start this whole process way before Jesus was born, Especially in the last days, these chosen people. Now, are we in the last days? All right, so these chosen people in the last days are going to be just exactly like Thomas. They are not going to believe in Jesus until they see him. They will not receive the message of salvation until they see with their own eyes Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was pierced in both hands and his side. But friends, this is not the proper way to receive the gospel. Waiting for something else to happen is not plan B in becoming a member of the flock of Jesus Christ. We should hear the gospel and believe. That's the way Jesus says it's going to be. Now I want you to notice what happens next in our story. After Thomas refuses to believe Jesus is alive, we see a period of time go by. At least eight days pass, and once again, we find the disciples in a locked room. Hiding from who? Those Jewish elite, right? They're still hiding from these guys. Things are still unsettled in Jerusalem after Jesus arose, even these days afterwards. Tension is still in the air. The disciples still feel like they need to conceal themselves. This time, though, when they do it, Thomas is in the room with them. And then Jesus appeared again. Somehow he appeared by bypassing the laws of nature and appearing in a room without going through a locked door. We talked about that last week. It's amazing, right? I'd like to know how he did it, but we know how he did it, right? <laughs> we know who Jesus is. Understand, this is the second time Jesus appeared to the disciples in a room. Now Jesus does the same thing on this visit that he did on his first visit. When we read in 26, he says to them out loud, Peace be to you. It's the same call this time by Jesus to those disciples to do what? To be obedient, to fulfill God's will, and to fulfill his purpose. Jesus then confronts Thomas, and he tells him to touch his wounds, right? To touch his pierced hands and his side. At that point, after Jesus does that, 
He commands Thomas, it's critical, he commands Thomas to stop the unbelief. To stop being against the faith and to start believing. Stop this and start this. That's what Jesus is teaching. This is a lesson for all of us, friends. When a person decides not to receive the truth, not to receive the message, not to receive the gospel, when a person chooses that to doubt right, right in front of him, it's just not the fact that you don't believe truth. That's not what's really going on here. What's really going on here is when you decide not to receive the truth, it means that you are against truth. That's what it means. There is no neutral position in this matter. If you don't believe the truth, then you are against the truth. Either you are for Jesus, or you are against Jesus. There is no in-between. As you know, and you, you all know, right, what the consequences for being against Jesus are, don't you? For not believing in our Messiah. Do you know what the consequences are? We all know this. It's not a surprise. Jesus is saying to Thomas, stop being against me. Stop disbelieving the truth that is right in front of you. Now, the issue of doubting things, of not believing things of Jesus, has plagued these disciples throughout his whole entire ministry. This belief was not just a Thomas thing. It was a disciple thing. And it started way before Jesus appeared in this room with Thomas in that game of 11 or 10. I think it was 10 Thomas. One example of this, as we see, was in Lazarus. Remember the story of Lazarus? Do you remember what happened with Lazarus? Let's read John chapter 11, 14, 15 minutes. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Believing in Jesus started way before doubt. Uh, disbelieving in Jesus started way before Thomas arrived. And Jesus dealt with disbelief of those original disciples way before he died, and certainly after he died. And perhaps Thomas was the most skeptical of the bunch. We get a glimpse of the personality of Thomas when he had an interaction with Jesus right before he was crucified. Thomas was a curious man. Thomas was an honest man. Thomas had no problem confronting Jesus. He didn't take things sitting down. He always needed extra confirmation. Let's revisit the confrontation between Thomas and Jesus right before the cru crucifixion when we read in John 14 this. Do not let your heart be troubled. Everybody knows that, right? Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Before Jesus is crucified, he's dealing with this whole subject of belief. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself. So that where I am, there you also will be. And you know the way, you know the way where I'm going, right? He asked. Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus says to him in response, The famous, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In this particular encounter, Jesus is again dealing with disbelief. He starts out speaking about believing in God and also about believing in Him. You see Thomas confront Jesus during this teaching about where he is going and how they are going to get there as well. That's where we get that Christian pillar statement by Jesus, right? This is one that all Christians recite with confidence. They spew it out almost daily. They hold this as part of their belief in Jesus when He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But back to our story, finally Thomas gets it. Like the light bulb goes off, right? Finally Thomas gets it. Finally, Thomas receives the full message. What is the full message, friends? Can you recite it? It includes the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. That's the full message. He receives it then, just like those other disciples received 
the full message just a few days earlier. Do you remember? When we read this in verse 28, this, And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas finally gets it. This is a statement right here, friends, right there. That is a statement of belief. This is a statement of Thomas accepting the gospel. That's what's going on here. Thomas acknowledges. He confesses. He submits. He finally submits to what? To the all authority of Jesus Christ. You remember Jesus talking about this. I have been given all authority, he says. Thomas is finally submitting to that all authority. He finally cries out loud to Jesus, You are my Lord and you are my God. Now friends, this is critical. This is so critical, this teaching by Jesus. If you believe Jesus Christ is Lord, if you believe that, then you have to believe He is God. If Jesus is your Lord, you have to accept Him as your master, as your ruler, and you have to be willing to submit to His all authority. He is your Lord, and He is your God. Please, don't get confused, friends. I am not saying that we are saved by how well we do this submitting to God. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you are saved by how well you serve Jesus. What I'm saying is, we are saved from the wrath of God by what Jesus did, not by anything we did. So we have to understand, what we're talking about here is something different. But if you claim, if you absolutely claim out loud to the public, like I am doing right now, if you claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ, then you must, must, must recognize the all authority of Jesus Christ. You must believe He is Lord, and you must believe He is God. Thomas finally gets this. He finally believes it. And we as believers, we better make sure we get this as too. Because there's no in between. Now in verse 29, next we see Jesus acknowledge that Thomas now believes. Because he had just seen Jesus with his own mind. Oh, nice. And then Messiah makes a bone-shattering statement about those people in the future who do not see Jesus but believe in Him. Who are the people in the future who do not see Jesus but believe in Him? That's us, right? That is us. So we're now talking fast forward to us and all those people in between. Jesus says those who believe without seeing Him are going to be what? Blessed. They're going to be blessed. So what in the world is Jesus meaning by this statement? What does it mean that you and I are blessed because we believe without seeing Jesus Christ? Now the word blessed can be connected to the word happy. Alright? Get that in your brain. Blessed is connected to the word happy. It's speaking about a contentment. It's a contentment that you get from faith. When we hear the truth, friends, when we hear the truth and we respond to the truth, which is critical, we are going to experience a source of happiness. We are going to be blessed. But in addition to this, being blessed is also connected to something else called perseverance. Do you remember what is said in Daniel chapter 12, verse 12 when we read this? Blessed is the one who is patient and attains to the 1,335 days. If you are blessed of God, you have contentment and you have perseverance to make it somewhere, to make it to the end of days. Hearing truth, responding to truth, and then believing in this truth results in a blessed life that is happiness in the kingdom of God. And we are also given perseverance to live this kingdom life out. Now in the final verses of chapter 20, we see how important believing is to redemption. We also find this concept of believing is related to redemption throughout entire scripture. It is not a New Testament thing. This believing started with the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Remember what we read in Genesis? Genesis 15.6 about Abraham. When we read 5 and 6 this. And he took him outside and he said, Now look at the heavens and count the stars. 
if you are able to count them. <laughs> and he said to them, to him, Show, so shall your descendants be. Then he, who's he? Abraham. Then Abraham believed in the Lord. And because he believed, what happened? He was credited with righteousness. This is a long process throughout history, not something new with Jesus. Abraham believed and he was given credit by God as being righteous. There is a connection, friends, between believing and redemption. There is a connection between redemption and faith in Messiah. You can't escape it. It's the way it is. And the world's telling you something different, isn't it? Now we are told Jesus did many, many things that are not written down in Scripture. Excuse me, in Scripture. I personally wish I could read about those things. Surely they were as magnificent as all the other stuff that we're reading. But we need to understand that the ones written in this book are there so that we all may believe as well. He says it clearly in verse 31. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Don't let this get by you, folks. Because we need to break this down real quickly. Let's break down what John is saying here. It is crucial for a believer to understand this. It is not, and I repeat, friends, it is not sufficient to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. That's not enough, friends. Are you throw something at me? It is not enough to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Many people, many, many, many people proclaim to believe Jesus is the Messiah. But you also have to believe something else. And that is Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God is in reference to what? The divine nature, the divinity of Jesus of Nazareth. Many people deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. Many people think He was a great man. You've heard it. Many people think he's a great prophet. You've heard it. They even think he's the Messiah sent to save the world, but some of them refuse to acknowledge the divine nature of Jesus Christ. That he is in fact the Son of God. Do you understand the critical part of this, folks? You have to understand who Jesus is. If you don't have that last part, if you don't believe who Jesus really is, the Son of God, His divinity, your faith is insufficient. If you don't believe that, your faith, no matter what anybody tells you, is inadequate. If a person does not believe in the divinity of Jesus, their faith will not save them. Because their faith will not bring the Holy Spirit into their life. Their faith, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, will not transform you. If you do not believe Jesus is divine, you are lost to Satan. Point blank. You can't argue anything else. The Apostle John tells us at the end of this chapter, when you believe Jesus is the Messiah and He is the Son of God, you have something. What do you have? You have life. You have life in His name. Don't miss what John is saying here, friends. If we miss this part right here, we're going to miss our call. By believing, by being a true believer, you have life in His name. What does that mean? The word name is synonymous with the word character. A true faith, a kingdom faith in His name is going to cause you, me, and all believers character to do something. It's going to cause our character to change into something else. What will it change into? Jesus' character. It means we are going to think like He thinks. We are going to speak with His character. We are going to behave demonstrating His character in our life. That is the result of true faith. I pray that none of you are experiencing any doubt about Jesus being Lord and God. If you do experience doubt, Jesus says, stop doing this now. If you have doubt, please partner with another believer and talk about this so you can become edified in that conversation. So you can see something different. So you can learn 
the truth. But also understand, friends, that as believers, it is our job to share the correct message. To share the gospel to those who will listen so they can have a chance to do what? To be a believer as well. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 14, everybody knows this, for the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. And there are very few who find it. Very few. We need to share the gospel, friends. We need to share the gospel. We need to do it correctly. We need to pray that some or all believers will become part of the few who enter through the narrow gate. We must help, friends. Jesus commands. We must help prepare the kingdom for the return of our Messiah. That's what we need to be doing. Now next week, we're going to see the disciples struggle with something that every believer struggles with. Every one of them. And that is staying committed to the Christ. That's a tough one to read, but we're going to talk about that next week. Is everybody in here saved? Does anybody in here need to give their life publicly to Jesus Christ because they know they don't belong to Him? Because if you don't, now's the time. If not, you want to do it publicly, get with me afterwards. We'll do it privately. But don't let it go by, friends, because we're in the end days. That being said, all men, Heavenly Father, I'll turn it over to you. I'm speechless. Is that good? Excellent. Oh, we're going to have quite a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Just call down on my knees. This is a good song right here.
Jesus Christ, what do you have to do today? Do we do that? Yes. You know, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to remember that we are His. And if we're not His, then we are in trouble, much trouble. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Father God, I just ask that you would help each one of us in your hearing today that we take to heart your life and what you have accomplished in our lives. And Father, I just pray that you would continue to work with each one of us. That you would help each one of us become more righteous each day. That we might glorify you in all that we say, all that we do. And I just pray that you would send people to us that need a touch. Father, let us be your ambassador for uh, the life giving that you, you're the only one who can give that life, Father. But we'll help you if we can get to that person. So God, I just ask that once again, as we leave this sanctuary today, that we remember that we're entering the mission field. So Father, be with us, guide and direct us, and give us the courage to do what you would have us to do. In our Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. 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 Ladies, don't forget Tuesday night is ladies' night at six o'clock. Woohoo! Well, <laughs>